What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to What's Your Story. So today I have my friend Nick on the show. We actually met at Springfield like a lot of the other people I've had on the show. But I've realized after talking with Nick a little bit more, we've had a lot in common. So I'm really excited for him to tell his story, you know, from him growing up being a professional BMX rider, um, going through injuries, ended up going to the strength conditioning field when we met at Springfield, did a really cool internships at multiple places, worked with the military, uh, high-end athletes all around. He's just got a really cool story just to show from the beginning of him getting into the sports, athletics, the competition side, to the point he is today and working with a lot of high-end athletes. So I kind of just want to jump right into it. Nick, welcome to the show, man. What's up, man? Appreciate it. This is, uh, this is pretty cool. Yes, it's very cool. And for anyone who doesn't know, this is round two. First round, we just didn't record anything. It just was a complete shit show. So um, anyway, it helped though, because I got to know you a little bit better. So we're going to talk a little bit to the, the beginning um, of where this all started for you. And, and we talked about before you being competitive as you grew up and being younger, and that started with kind of the BMX racing. So if you don't mind, let's go back to that. When, when did you start getting into BMX, riding BMX, and how did that all start? Yeah, so I got into uh, into BMX racing probably around the age of like seven or eight. Um, at the time, my parents had uh, decided to get a divorce and stuff, and my dad, my dad was dating somebody else, and um, so I would see him on the weekends, like most when that situation happens. And uh, she had a son who was thirteen. Like I said, I was about seven or eight, and my dad had to bring him to the BMX track because he raced. Track was about five minutes from his house, and uh, checked it out and you know racing of some sort has always been in my family um or at least on my dad's side he used to race cars uh at like the local uh like dirt track and stuff like that so it just kind of was something that i don't know for whatever reason i gravitated to and uh it kind of started up from there um i actually only raced for a short period of time you know i started when i was about seven or eight and i quit when i was like nine or ten um just i i honestly I, I was young and i don't really remember why a little bit of a gap and then i moved to where uh my parents live now which is in, in germantown and um which is in new york it's middle of nowhere and somebody moved actually to the same town that i used to race with when i was little and we just happened to talk and reconnect and he told me i should come down to the track and check it out again and uh the rest is history i started back up at 13 and raced till i was about 23. so got into it more of just you being a competitive kid growing up was that more or less that was kind of your outlet to competition you feel like yeah i think uh you know i really can't can't explain why i got into it at, at, you know at a young age I think Your it was just something was into, like dirt bikes and stuff like that. Right. Uh, he raced cars, cars more than okay. dirt bikes. Um, but my dad was always, always a little bit of a, uh, of a daredevil of sorts. You know, he would always tell me stories, you know, he, he grew up not very well off. And so he would always tell me stories about how they would go sledding with like car hoods That's awesome. and things like that. So I think BMX was just a, a more, Though it is expensive at the same time, kind of an inexpensive outlet. And it was a way for me to spend more time with him as a kid because we didn't live near each other. And, and like I said, my parents had separated. So, you know, I would go do that every weekend. So it went from seeing him maybe every other to now seeing him more often and doing that. And um, that's kind of just kind of where it went. And at the age of 13 to 23, it got bigger into my life because uh it became something that i actually was pretty decent at and pretty good and i had some runs where i was actually competitive and doing it at a pretty high level um so that's kind of what kept that going for me gotcha. and so you get into it more competitively you talked about kind of in that 16 17 age range where it kind of picked up to be that professional status so we talked a little bit before but do you mind telling how that happened your whole professional story of when you turn professional and like the whole concept of racing amateur and then just kind of committing all in to see what happens with it yeah so i, I didn't <laughs> i didn't turn pro the way most people would turn professional uh usually the most the way that people would turn professional is you know about 16 or 17 they're just killing the amateur scene winning every single national or at least winning a lot and uh, um and then they turn up because their plan is to make it to the next level which is elite or double a pro 
uh, I was actually at like my peak at like 16, 17 years old, had a pretty bad accident uh, um, training. And after that, recovering from that, uh, I went from being like at the top of my game to for whatever reason, whether it was just I was weak or I aged up to a harder class, but I also had to take six to eight months off, things like that. Uh, I just wasn't having fun anymore. And you could tell that I was just kind of defeated. And one of my friends uh, talked me into it at the first race of the year. Um, I can't remember the year to be honest with you, but he just told me, he was like, Hey man, like you should just turn pro. I was like, why the hell would I turn pro? Like I, I went from making main events at big races to now I'm getting my ass kicked and I'm just what we call moto fill. Like I'm just showing up to show up. Right. And he just kind of goes and he's like, and it kind of goes to your chase discomfort. He was just like, dude, you're not having fun anymore. Like, you put too much expectation on yourself. Like, just go have fun. Just go ride your bike. You probably think you're going to get your ass kicked. You probably will. But go in there with no expectations and just go have fun. It's cool to race pro, right? They announce your name. There's music. You're the first race of the day. All things like that. So he's like, dude, just go have fun with it. And uh, my first race, I actually made the semifinal. And then from there, it just kind of, kind of became a thing. And, you know, I still wasn't great. I wasn't as good as I was when I was amateur. Um, I was like a middle of the pack guy would make a few main events here and there. Uh, but you know, once I got to about the age of 21 to 22 is where my a pro career started taking off and I started to get a little bit better. Gotcha. Now, when it comes to getting better on that side of it, obviously to work your way up to that level where there's people, you know, that are very good. What on a week to week basis, were you riding like during the week, just the weekends? Like, you know, what, what did that kind of look like for you? Cause obviously, you know, some people are just gifted and pick up things very quickly, but then other people need to put in like riding every single day. And I know a lot of the tracks were, you know, hard to get to at times. How, how did that look like for you on a week to week basis? Yeah. So I was, uh, where I'm, where I live, well, where my family's from, you know, I'm very fortunate that there's a pretty big BMX scene. Um, so basically what a, what a week or what a day would look like is, uh, it, it depended on, on the day or the, or I should say like what age I was at. Like when I was 16 to 17, dude, it was all bikes. It was all bikes all the time. Like Monday, Wednesday would be racing at one or racing slash practice at one track Tuesday Thursday would be racing and practice at another track and so I'm riding all the time but then at the same time I uh I had really really good friends that I met at the BMX track that actually had trails and dirt jumps in their backyard or there were these local spots that were kind of like invite only or whatever um that we would just ride trails and get better at hitting jumps and just getting comfortable on the bike and we would be there for hours. Like there was a convenience store across the street. So we'd go there, we'd get our water. We'd get like a bunch of hot dogs and bring them to the freaking track or to the trails. And we would just ride all day. Um, so when I was younger and I had the time, it was a lot of riding in some gym. Um, once I grew up and kind of had to get a job and everything like that, it obviously took a little bit of a backseat, but just always kind of stay the same, you know, always riding my bike and us as coaches, you know, working with athletes, we, we're we great and, and we're a good resource as strength coaches, but at the same time, like nothing's going to get you better at your sport than your sport. Right. Um, so I tried to spend it. I tried at the time to spend as much time on my bike as humanly possible. That makes sense. I think a lot of it too is just, I, I think it's, it's good to say that because I think a lot of people don't realize what it takes at any sport to get to the next level you know, they see an NBA talent, they see an NFL talent, they see all this stuff and they blame, they, you know, they're genetic freaks, right? right? There's no doubt. But you look at even like the Julian Edelman's and these little guys of the world, the work ethic that needs to be put in to be good at anything or great at anything, that right. goes, I think, unseen too, too much. Maybe with social, it's starting to get seen more, but right. the work ethic has to be on another level, you know? Yeah, the, uh, uh, you know, the book Outliers talks about it right there, right? The 10,000 hour rule. Um, 10,000 hours of purposeful and like high level practice uh, is what makes you elite um, or at least has the potential to make you elite. What they found was the guys, the people that are at their highest level had, had ranked in 
are turned in about 10,000 hours minimum of practice. So whether that's starting at a young age and like you're, you're a kid hooping in the city and you just go and play by yourself or play with friends at the park or whatever. And like, eventually you start to just pick things up. Um, I think that's kind of what goes into sport. You know, we can make you faster, we can make you stronger, but that field vision or the mental aspect or being able to pick up on little things, uh, you can't do that without actually exposing yourself to the sport more and more and seeing those possibilities. Yeah, it makes sense. So you get to a point now where you're, you're racing pretty well, you're doing, you know, you're all in with it, you're doing as much as you can, but then you start going to school and you end up going to Springfield strength conditioning. Um, two parts to it. Do you mind telling like what, like what led you to end up going to Springfield, that whole story behind it? And then when you get to Springfield, like why strength conditioning? So uh, I actually go this way. Strength and conditioning actually led me to Springfield. Gotcha. Um, Cause I, so at the time I was racing, I've had a couple injuries, uh, which is not uncommon in, in that sport. And I was training at a Parisi speed school. Um, and I loved training. Like, I loved going to the gym. It was fun. Uh, I loved being around basically other people that worked hard and we all pushed each other. And like, you know, we talked about this yesterday. One of the really funny things was my graduation present. People were getting cars and stuff. I asked my mom if I can get more training sessions at, at Parisi. Yeah. On top of that, you know, I was late to my own graduation party because I told her I had to go train that morning. I love that. So it was kind of what, what I always wanted to do and fast forward when I kind of couldn't afford it anymore. And, and when it kind of started to go downhill, cause coaches were leaving, like, it's like anything else, good coaches leave. And then you get other ones that maybe aren't so great. And, and now that whole relationship kind of gets busted. So I stopped going for a little bit, um, end up working a job uh, as a car wash attendant or whatever, went to lunch. Just, I don't know why, but I realized it wasn't for me. And I went to lunch and never came back. Um, I don't suggest it. Wasn't, wasn't one of my proudest moments because it was kind of a cowardly move. But at the same time, I was just like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. It's a big changing moment, though. You know, I think that's a big kind of turning moment. Yeah. And, you know, it's also one of those things where you're like, all right, I kind of burned a bridge here. So whatever. But not that it was a big bridge because it's, it's honest work. It was hard work. It was just not what I saw myself doing for the rest of my life. And so I stopped off at Parisi Speed School just to see who was still there. And um, I ended up having a conversation with the owner of the actual gym. And he asked what I was doing. I told him what I had just done. And he luckily didn't think I was an asshole. And he thought it was kind of funny. But he was like, well, why don't you be a coach here? And I was like, I have no education in this. And he goes, you were an athlete here for two to three years. You know the system inside and out. So he's like, we can teach you all the other stuff. Just do that. So decided and ended up being a coach for the Parisi Speed School. Um, one of the certifications I had to get, had to get me to do a internship, uh, which Parisi didn't count. So I ended up actually through calls and stuff. That's a longer story, but, or another long story, but through phone calls, got connected with Siena College. Uh, Dan Taylor, who was the strength coach at the time, who's now with Georgia Tech men's basketball, he was there and uh, he basically put his put his leg out for me and just brought me in to be a basically he was calling me like a volunteer assistant like there was a book that came out with like all the staff and he made sure that I got put in there as like assistant. Um, and yeah, he helped me out big time and gave me that opportunity to be a volunteer assistant knowing absolutely nothing. Sure. And uh so we had to sit down and we decided, all right, if you want to do this, you need to get a bachelor's. And that led me to Springfield um, because that's one of the predominantly great exercise science schools. Well, and then you said, uh, before we go deeper into Springfield, um, one thing I want to talk about too, is this was a big reason for you to stop riding too. You talked about the other day with um, you know, your mom kind of gave you an ultimatum, but there was also yeah. two big injuries that probably started to pull you into that direction. One, I think it was your spleen, yeah. I think you said, and then the other one, just a bad crash, shoulder, hit your head. And that was kind of another moment. You're like, man, I need to start looking in a different direction. You want to tell that, that little story? Yeah. Yeah. So 
you know, I've had my share of crashes. Uh, I mean, I've known people that have had worse crashes than me and more crashes than me, or at least like more serious injuries than me. Um, but I've had a few pretty good ones that, that definitely rocked me. But, uh, you know, 16 to 17, uh, basically that transition from when I was at the peak of 16 to 17 to where I wasn't having fun anymore and I sucked. Um, I had a crash training for the Grand Nationals in Kentucky. And um, I ended up basically lacerating my spleen. Um, had to get medevaced from Kingston, New York to Albany Med and go through all that stuff. So that kind of obviously put things a little bit, I, I can't even say put things in perspective because I wasn't scared or anything after the fact. It just kind of, it was six to eight month recovery. So it really kind of physically beat me down. Um, then after that, once I got rolling and, and in pro, um, I wasn't making a killing on the money scene. You know, I wasn't doing, this wasn't a career. You know, I'd show up from a race and I'd have to go back to a normal nine to five job. So I think I was working retail at the time at like a pack sun or something. And, um, yeah. And so, you know, I had that crash. It was literally in practice, ended my weekend. I didn't get to start my weekend. Really. I had to like roll the track, but, um, we have to race, hit this pro section, uh, at this race called uh, Louisville at the NBL grand nationals and just made a mistake. Again, I'm not the most skilled kind of a bull in the China shop and, um, just made a mistake and landed shoulder and head first separated my shoulder and you know i'm just like dude what am i doing like i'm 23 you know i'm still living at home and like my parents are fortunately supporting me but she was just kind of like look i don't care that you do this but i can't keep i can't afford to keep supporting this and like helping you out and having you live here like you're 23 years old you got to figure it out um and so that's when everything kind of shifted and then, and I was like, okay. And, uh, and then again, after that, that's when the car wash thing happened and everything like that. So. Gotcha. Well, you were super persistent too, in that transition. So you, so we talked about like you, you brought up, you know, how you, um, applied for Springfield three times, got denied, yep. got denied two and a half. You should say two it like half. that. Right. Yeah. But, um, but like, so what kept you to keep pushing towards it? Was it just the fact that you knew something clicked, had to click anyway, that you really wanted to do strength conditioning, you wanted to go back to school to, with your coaching and everything? Is that what just kind of kept motivating you to keep applying, applying until you got in? Yeah, I, I knew that this is finally like what I wanted. Um, you know, when you're in high school or whatever it is, everybody asks you, what do you want to do? Like, bro, you're 17, 18 years old. Nobody pardon my friend nobody knows what the fuck they want to do no one has you know been. everybody it's like if i went to college i'll be honest if i went to college when i graduated high school like legit college it would have been a shit show i would have wasted a couple hundred grand and i'd still be probably coming back home with no concept of what i wanted to do so uh at that point you know me being persistent again going back to it was this is what i wanted to do this is what it, science is something that I've always loved. Um, you know, he actually just retired. They just had his retirement thing with all the cars because of COVID. But um, Mr. Hansen was our science teacher and bro, I would go have lunch in that dude's office and we would sit and talk science. And, uh, and that was always what I fell in love with. And then the training and also not, not always being the most talented in sports or whatever it is, but always being that grinder or just that person that's going to work hard and um always wanted to push myself there uh that's kind of the part i fell in love with and i saw how it took me from a middle of the pack guy to a top guy so you know if i could do it for me i, I want to do that for other people that maybe don't have the opportunity so being persistent just like i said you know not to reiterate but it's what i wanted well, it's the work ethic, that part of it that in the gym, and that's why I love it so much, because number one, you can have complete control of what happens. You know, the results that you get are rely on your work you put in, the nutrition, your sleep, and no one else can do that for you or control that. So even as a coach, it can be hard at times, but from an athlete, you know, there's so many people I look at that could have been so much better. You look at like the J.R. Smiths of the world or all these people that freak athletic ability the the Dwight Howards who could have been like the better Shaquille O'Neal's like the I mean the these people that 
are genetically gifted and obviously worked hard to get there, but um, you know, their potential could be another level in the same regard to someone who maybe doesn't have that, but puts in the work ethic they should have been, you know, and then you have that sweet spot where you get the Michael Jordans, the Kobe Bryant's that just, it's the whole work ethic and talent all combined to, to yeah. explode. I love that side of it because you can yeah. control so much. Yeah. And I mean, and on, on the other side too, is like, like, I don't know what he would tell you. Um, but I just can remember. So when I left and when I went to Springfield and I finally got in, I ended up joining the track team and bro, I sucked. Like I, <laughs> I was not great at all. Uh, and Ken Toll was on the track team okay. and, uh, Ken and I ended up becoming pretty close friends, but I mean, obviously that dude can snatch and whatever and clean a house. Um, but at the time, like there was shit that we, when we would be in the weight room together, like I would line up next to him and let's say it was weighted pull-ups. I would always go and I would either do like, or try to do more reps than him or more weight than him. Like just to not just push myself, but then it would push. Well, I would assume I'm thinking, I don't know what he would say, but right. then it pushes him to go a little harder. Right. And so now we have this competition and like now all of a sudden, maybe I'm not the best and maybe I'm not great on the track. Maybe I'm fast or not fast, but now I, I just gave myself or I, I just provided some value to that team by helping and pushing people to work harder. And, uh, and that's kind of just always where strength and conditioning kind of fell for me is just like, you know, you can teach these things and the person that's always the best isn't always the best. Well, I talked to a few people, especially at the Springfield, a lot of them were like, you know, the school was good. You know, there's different things they wanted more of or less of, or, you know, the experience was great, but the environment from a competitive standpoint and having people that are just wanting to push themselves and being a very athletic school, I think that played a big factor. Cause I know when I was in the strength room, stuff like that, I was around a lot of people, you know, it was bodybuilding, powerlifting stuff, but just like being around the Nick Zach Hedges, the Rob Kearney's, the, you know, all these dudes that are just straight monsters, but are just like working at such a high level. It plays over to what you're saying is being in, an environment of just successful, motivated people and then playing off each other. Yeah. That was, what's great about Springfield, right. Um, is like you just said, it, it didn't matter what you did. It didn't matter if you were a bodybuilder, didn't matter if you were a strong man, didn't matter if you were a power lifter, a sprint athlete, whatever it is, there was a group for you. Yeah. And everybody wanted to be the fucking best. Yeah. Hopefully. And I that, missed that. Like I've never seen a fitness center so full all the time. Dude, I miss, I talked to Dustin Wilson about it, CJ Harper about it. All these guys that are just, that we're like, man, we fucking miss that place because yeah. I, didn't re- I was the strongest I ever was there. I was the biggest I ever was there. Um, I just, I didn't realize it, but it was just, you go in and you're like heavy squat day. And there's always three or four people that love squatting or something. And they're just there to like hype you up. Yeah. And now I go into my LA fitness and it's like, this is cool. You know, um, yeah. yeah, I don't know if you know, I just interviewed him. I didn't post it yet. You know, he's, he was a freshman when I went there. So probably you didn't know of him, but maybe you saw him. Jack Pinto, runner. I feel, so like, I know the, I feel like I know the name. Dude, he broke the Springfield um, 800 meter, the one mile. Um, and he was uh, all American. Like That's all this wild, stuff. man. And, and he went to Springfield, had to walk on the track team. And he ran a 407 mile at, um, at Springfield. Jesus. Broke the 800 meter, which was like sub two or something like that, like 157 or whatever it was. But anyway, I just interviewed him and it's wild to listen to people that like I 407 mile and he just ran a 403 and he's trying to break the four minute and he's like 23 years old. And I'm just like, I can't, it's just being around those people, even just talking to people. The show has helped me with a lot of those kind of people. It's just like, man, that motivates me just to hear like people pushing to that level. You know, like that's such a wild thing. And then we'll talk, you know, so you're at Springfield and this is kind of a good way to transition it is, you know, you get, you're around all these people at Springfield. Then you do a lot of cool internships from um, different places. And one cool one, obviously we talked about is, you know, the Brooklyn Nets and, and different things than going into the military. But like, you know, with a, what was like your favorite, not favorite, but one of the coolest internships, whether you took the most information from or an experience that you had or, you know, whatever direction you want to go with. Yeah, that's a tough one. So, you know, I would say they were all like, I I know this is a very generic answer, so I apologize, but like they all had their own, like they were all fun. They were all awesome. Um, 
if I had to sit there and I had to say one that I learned the most from, it would have to be when I interned uh, as a performance coach at XOSLA. Okay. Um, I mean, that was cool because we got to experience a lot of cool things and uh, we, we got to work with a lot of really, really high level people. You know, um, we helped with some performance, like we basically helped run performance testing for the U S national team when they were there. And uh, one of the guys that was an intern, like we would switch out every couple months. So first half would be with somebody and then first half would be with another coach or another half or another group. So like, if you were there, um, you know, you could get to experience being a strength coach with the LA galaxy. Uh, um, so just so many, you know, the NFL combine group, uh, the NFL vet group, which is basically anybody that's been in the league a year or more, but honestly, the the biggest reason why I took the most away from there was uh, I was a douchebag, and I say like that. Ego or just what was that? Like an ego or just. So I was given some pretty shitty information going there uh, by somebody um, because you know I wanted to make a good impression there and I wanted to do really well. So I was kind of you know I talked to somebody that had been there and they were saying yeah they're going to make you do a lot of like you know, a lot of intern work. Um, so really try to impress and try to show that, that you're knowledgeable and, and that you can be trusted in that sense. And, and so uh, they were saying like, try to impress with what you know, because it's a high level place. And that's what I ended up doing was I just tried to use all my other internships and all my certifications that I had at the time and everything like that. And I came off as just this cocky, arrogant asshole. And I basically went from like just being within the group, but now you have people that aren't as experienced as me, wouldn't work as hard, or I can't say wouldn't work as hard, wouldn't study as hard because they definitely worked harder than me as far as like the actual intern stuff. And they're getting more responsibility whereas I'm getting less. And finally, I went to the performance coach there and I asked him if we could sit down and talk. And one of the things like I'll never forget, he said to me, he was like, you're, you're really smart, dude. He's like, there's no doubt about it. He goes, you know what you're doing? Like, we, we don't doubt that for a second. But he's like, we can teach them that. We can't teach them the character. And your character's coming off very questionable. So basically, you. what was that? How did that hit you? Oh, it sucked. It was like, it, because that's not how I was trying to come across. You know, I was given this information and I was trying to be, you know, if you ask anybody that I worked with, you know, I, I'd hope to say that, you know, I worked really hard and um, that just wasn't me. So to hear that was kind of like a gut check. And, but it was also a big reality check of, you know, your character means way more than any of your education in any job or any opportunity that you get. Um, so that's probably the biggest takeaway that I've gotten from any of my internships or anything along those lines is like, just go in, you know, get after it and, uh, you know, just, just shut your mouth and open your ears and, and work hard. Um, big, big part of that is just, you know, I, and it's, I think it's hard for a lot of people too. And I did see this a lot at Springfield and maybe it was a mix of people wanting to be better and they're always trying to improve, but there was a lot of times or just people in general that have a trouble being humble or maybe not trying to think they know it all. And, you know, cause you're in a school setting, it's competitive at times and you're always trying to like compete, especially at that type of atmosphere. But yeah, I can agree to that as you, you know, as you get into the field, you get a real reality check of like, you may be smart, but you know nothing compared to what's out there. And then if right. you kind of have a, I know nothing mentality and trying to always learn and improve, because I was the same way as like, even like, you know, I know how to coach someone, but even going to Equinox and going through some basic stuff, and I'm like, whoa, wait, like it, this is a different setting than I'm used to. Or you're going to another place and, you know, you just get gut punched in a way at times of uh, like who you're working with, the concepts and yeah, it, it is wild, man, because I've seen a lot of that, too, um, you know, and I, I try to pride myself not having an ego, but, um, you know, if you, you get caught sometimes like that, you know, when someone yeah. else in different situations, so. Yeah. So you go through that experience, 
And then up to recently, you were doing stuff with the military. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of what was your role with the, the military stuff they are doing between like strength coaching and, and different things along those lines? Yeah, so my, uh, so I just got done uh, working with the asymmetric warfare group. Uh, it's a branch of the army um, that, or a unit within the army, I should say. Uh, they're what's called a special missions unit. Um, and so basically these are like, these are, battle-worn veterans uh that still go and fight um some do some don't so i would basically work with uh retired contractors civilian contractors deployable and non-deployable um tactical athletes so my role there was kind of personal trainer performance coach at times rehab specialist uh you name it you know we had to we had to kind of train it and do it um, so that was my role, you know, it was actually pretty limited. Um, but it was a lot of fun cause I kind of got to do all aspects. Right. So, you know, in the morning I would train what's called the advisor's training cl uh, course, basically a five month long course where we trained about two hours every morning for four days. And, uh, um, that was every five months and, and there was like a two month break and then we'd get another group. Gotcha. Um, so that was probably the most fun cause that was like training a sports team you know everything was pretty much calculated there was a what they call a cadre which is basically the tactical uh side that teaches them things like marksmanship they'll do comms training they'll do all that stuff <clears throat> so when we communicated uh it was awesome and it, it ran like a well-oiled machine and um it was hard and the reason it's hard is you're going into a field where they've seen a lot of different type of training they've been told a lot of different things and they also think they know a lot. Um, well, it's got to be a lot of egos there to an extent. And that, that's it, right? You know, they try to tell you how to train. So it took me, again, kind of put my ego in check to where I had to take a step back and be like, okay, I can't tell these guys, you know, what they want or what they need or whatever. For the most part, unless it was the ATC, which is the advisor training course, like then it was – it was like working with a team like this is what we say this goes i will answer any questions you have we'll have a conversation but this is what we're doing and this is why when you start working with other people you know you kind of have to they kind of have to come to you so i would just hang out in the weight room sometimes and just do my best to answer any questions they have you know crossfit's big in there so i wouldn't sit there and try to knock crossfit too much i'd more or less just uh you know try to be a supplement to it. If somebody had an issue, for example, one of the guys loved to bench press and his shoulder was bothering him. And he asked me, you know, I forgot what he asked me, but I saw him and I was like, Hey man, like, why don't you chill benching for a little bit? He's like, Oh, I just love to bench press. And so I can sit there and be like, well, you can't cause your shoulder hurts. But basically what I said, I was like, well, why don't you try floor pressing for a little bit? Say, do a floor press or something, right? Just get the bar, do a floor press. You ever try to floor press? And he's like, oh, I've done a little bit. I was like, just try it. And then I queued him up on a few things. He did that for a few weeks. And then this dude went from never talking to me to like, he still didn't like work with me full time. But now all of a sudden, like he sees I'm not trying to impose. I'm just trying to help. If you need it, I'm here, that kind of deal. So that was basically what my role was um, as far as there. Uh, I will be starting a new role at Seymour Air Force Base in Goldsboro with the Air Force um, very soon, hopefully, knock on wood. Yeah, just with everything uh, going on, it's kind of a yeah. scenario. Do you Jimbo, chill like out. Sorry. It's okay. No, no, you're fine. The man, is he wants attention. Oh, no, he's pissed because um, I knocked on wood and he barks when he hears knocking. Oh, like a door? Yeah. Yeah. Jimbo, come here. So do you feel like – the was it i mean you coached in so many different avenues so from like, springfield the internships the jobs the different things like that do you feel like the military side that's where it really dug in deeper to really working more of a mindset thing or is that something you've kind of developed over the years in general and or, or kind of how how is that because mindset's so important i feel like with the military there's a lot of moving components different types of people yeah the cool thing about all those different places and all those different spots is it kind of gives you an opportunity to see like where your weaknesses are. So, you know, all right, we're at Springfield and you're the head of the powerlifting club, or you just train, you just strength change, strength train, strength train. 
Um, but now you don't, now you go to maybe a performance side, but you see that you have a weakness in understanding how to program speed and agility training or plyos or things like that. Uh, so what the military did for me or the military, or I'll say the tactical side, uh, is it exposed the hell out of me as far as how to keep these guys strong and basically how to train concurrently. So all physical qualities at once, but also work on like the conditioning aspect. You know, I had a base knowledge of the conditioning and programming and stuff, but you know, these guys are a different case, you know, a different animal. So it really put an emphasis on having me coach and get better at training conditioning. Um, and then also, like you said, then I started thinking about the mindset, just having conversations with some of the tactical guys about, uh, and we talked about this yesterday, like anybody can ruck for miles or hike for miles with stuff on their back or whatever, and just embrace the suck. You know, this sucks, this sucks. I just got to get there. I just got to get there. But when you're out there, you can't be thinking that way. You know, you have to keep your head on a swivel and you have to think about what threats are out there while doing this sucky stuff. Um, so that became something that kind of challenged me to think outside the box and figure out how I can train the mind, uh, as well as the body under fatigue and under stress and other things like that. Yeah. It's like, that's the thing I've learned too, over the years is, you know, the simple fact of the mindset's off, you know, you're saying like, you know, anyone can do this, anyone can do this. Like, it's true. Anyone can truly train for anything, but like, you know, even if you're not say in the military, but you know, you're okay, we're going to go do this super long hike jog thing. And how many people mentally shut down and quit when their body's physically capable of, you know, from the David Goggins mentality of, you know, you're at 40% body's capable of so much more. And, um, you know, I think if you can start to tap into like how to get to that uncomfortable level of your body's fatigued, you're tired, you're breathing heavy, but being able to move forward. And, and I think you have to go through those uncomfortable situations and overcome them to almost start to have that click. Cause you have to program that mind like day after day after day of like embracing the suck, you know? Right. And yeah. to me, that's a huge part. So um, it's interesting because over the years um, you overcome a lot from you know, maybe from the injuries, maybe from going to school, starting a little later um, and trying to figure yourself out and going through so many different avenues through your career, of, you know, not necessarily motivation, because I feel like motivation is bullshit at times, but how have you continued to always push yourself to be better on like a day-to-day -day basis, you know, like how, how, for you, is it just a bigger picture? Um, you know, like, because everyone struggles day-to-day -day at times. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... So I think it comes in, in kind of ways or two ways, like as far as pushing myself, it's, uh, you know, the first one would be everybody that's helped me get to where I am. You know, I'm a big, I'm a big guy on, I really want to uh, make them proud and really kind of want to do it for them. So, you know, I don't want to ever let anybody down that gave me an opportunity to do something. Um, I've had situations where I have, you know, I've made some pretty big mistakes and some pretty dumb ones, but um, I've come out a better person for them is kind of try to how I look at it is like, well, I know I'll never do that again. Um, so that's kind of the big one is just for everybody that's done it for me to kind of make them proud and, and show that their work and their faith in me wasn't uh, unwarranted. and then to do the same for others, right? Like there's going to be people that are going to follow us. And I've had a lot of people, like I said, about a bunch, like a bunch of coaches I've worked with have put their neck out there for me. And I want to do the same for other people. Um, and I want to get to a level that when I put my neck out there for them, I can actually do. Cause I, I, maybe you can attest to this. I've had plenty of people that say they can help me with things that maybe can't help me as much as they think they can. Right. You know, uh, it's not that their heart's in the wrong place. It's just maybe, you know, they're, um, maybe they just think they have more pull than they really have. Right. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you know, I want to be at the level where I can say that I can help you get somewhere or help you do something. And I think a lot of people to your point too, with that is, I think how many times, like this happened to me just you know, recently, you know, I'll talk to a friend of like, Hey, like I'm doing my podcast. 
like I'll put out information. I'm rebranding. I want to make a new logo. Who knows someone with logo? And everyone's like, oh, I know everybody with logo. And they're right. like, try this guy. And they're like, oh, I'd love to help. And then a week, two weeks, three weeks go by. I reach out a couple of times and I don't hear back or like stuff like that. And it's like, I think, like you said, intention is good for a lot of people to help things. Or, you know, maybe someone's like, oh yeah, man, I work here. You can get you a job. And it's like, they want to like help. But at the same time, it's like they they either don't follow through number one or number two, they don't have the clout that they think they do. Um, yeah. I've dealt with like a lot of stuff like that. Cause it's always interesting, man, of like, everyone wants to help me do stuff or like, well, you know, but then no one follows through or like, I'll give someone an opportunity. I'll, be, I'll pay you to do this and they don't follow through. So I think a lot of people have trouble with like accountability, discipline, and just, I think teaching those things. And I try to, I've got better over the years, but I've always been a huge thing of like, you got to be a man to your word. And I used to say things and do things and not follow through with things. And, and I do do that with myself at times, but I try to like, if someone shoots me a message, like I will get back to you. Or if I say I'm going to do something, I will get back. Because like you said, as you get into your career and stuff, those things hold a lot of water. If someone right. can rely on you or not. So right. yeah, it, it's tough. Yeah. That's, that's the biggest one for me. And, and I mean, I guess, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing. Like I said, you know, it's people that really do want to help. They seem genuine in, in what they want, but it's like, at the same time, it's just like admitting, you know, admitting when you don't know. Yeah. Which is so very if hard. If you can't help. Yeah. So if you can't help, you know, just, just be like, Hey, good luck. If I can help in any way, like, let me know what I can do to help. Because now if you tell me like, okay, what can I do to help? And maybe it's not reaching out to somebody that you think you know, or that you think you, they remember you from an internship five years back. Um, you can tell them whether you can help them in that way or you can't. Um, How about even with a client though? I, you know, I think there's too many coaches and stuff like that, that like maybe your, your expertise is strength conditioning, stuff like this. Yeah. And someone's like, has a million issues. That's not really your experience. But like, no, no. Like, I'll take you as a client, I'll help you out. And then all of a sudden you're in over your head and it can kind of be a shit show. So I think, you know, you got to be self-awareness is very, very key. Yeah. And like, you want to learn and, and improve and do things. But I think if people need to be very self-aware um, yeah. in, in a lot of different avenues. And when it comes to what they truly want, how much influence is coming in from your parents, your friends of what you're supposed to do compared to there's the guests coming in hot. <laughs> I guess she's just going to sit here. She's like, you know what? This is my <laughs> Post is another. Cool. Maddie, come here. Over but here. it's crazy, man, because I think like that's a big part too. Is people have to realize like, what do you want? Like, right. what do you truly want? Not what your family wants, not what society wants. You know that whole eighteen, twenty-two, thirty age expectations. And I think it's very hard to shut off from social media, sit alone in a room for like an hour, and just think of like, what is the best situation for you, and what do you truly want? It's hard. And I think, you know, the 18, 22, 30, you're also a different person at each of those ages. Big time. I am not the same person at 18 that I was at 22 that I was at 30 or that I am at 30. Dude, I was engaged at 23. Like, it was a shit show. Like, yeah. it was a different whole mess. And I was delivering pizzas, going to a community college. You know, it was, like you said, it's a different game, man. So it's, it's funny because yeah. you don't feel like that when you're that age. And then all of a sudden between usually, at least from me, from like 23 to 30, 25 to 30, my mindset is a whole different game. Right. Um, yeah, and it's just, you know, you grow up in different yeah. perspective. So a couple more questions. Um, yeah. So when it comes to overcoming, uh, like say those injuries and things like that, I think there's a lot of value to people. Um, like you're rocking the Jocko shirt, obviously you're a positive dude. You, you are like, you know, kind of embracing discomfort. You're always pushing yourself when you hit those low points, like where you want to give up, or maybe, I don't know if you've had those and maybe throughout your training career, when you're looking for jobs or maybe the injuries, like, how do you dig yourself out of one of those holes and move forward? Cause I think everyone deals with depression. Everyone, you know, maybe sees you now the successful coach and done all these things and like, wow, look at his resume, but you've been through a lot and you had to overcome a lot. How do you dig yourself out of like those tough situations? For me personally, it's, uh, it's, it's corny as it sounds. It's just friends that you can count on, man. You know, uh, like I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of, uh, recent and like, I've had low points and stuff and some recent ones where, you know, it was tough to dig out and especially right now, right? Like looking at it and 
I guess we say like, I'm a successful coach and whatever, like, yes, I have a career in coaching and, and I'm successful in that aspect and I can be okay. But, you know, now I'm in this limbo because of Corona where people, some people still are, you know, okay. And now I'm sitting here like, okay, am I even going to have a job um, out of this, you know? So I guess you can even call this one kind of a low point too. Um, but just having people in your circle that will not judge you that, you know, you can trust, you can literally tell everything to like, Hey, I did something really dumb and just have them be like, okay, well, you're a fucking idiot. And, you know, have you come up with what's the problem, what's the solution and just kind of, kind of talk you out of that. And that will take the time to talk you out of that. Um, that's kind of the big thing. I'm very fortunate that I have a lot of people that I trust, uh, that have kind of talked me out of whatever, dark low points that I've had. So that's the big thing for me is because I knew everything aside from just the the blanket, oh, everything's going to be okay. Right. Because that's just like, you know, those are the people that really don't know you. They're like, oh man, I'm sorry that you're going through stuff. You'll be okay. Right. Like, well, will I? Like, do you know what's going on? Like, you know, and, right. and it's almost like how you, it's so funny how a few words can just change everything. Because for a year and a half, I went through very low. When I left Boston, I went from making very good money I felt lost as a coach. I took a job that I didn't really want. And then I got injured, lost like 10, 15 pounds of muscle. I lost for a long time. I lost my identity. I was the bodybuilding fitness guy. That's all I posted. That's all I did. And then now I'm small relative to what I was. I'm weak and I don't have the job I'm doing and I'm making no money. So it's like, what the fuck just happened? You know? So it's funny because like no one really knows what everyone's going through. So I think that's a big thing I talk about too, is like, be kind, be a good human being because you don't know what people are going through. You know, even if they're dicks, like just take, brush it off, move on. But like, at least you're being a good person. I think more people just have to keep it simple. It's like, just be a good human, like talk to other people, reach out to other people, be genuine. Like people know when you're bullshitting, you know? So it's like, but I think that can be a big thing too. And I definitely can relate, man. It's, it's tough because a lot of people, uh, you know, put on a lot of fronts and I think, you know, we need to get rid of that false impression of reality with social media and stuff. It, yeah. it, it, it fucks with people. Yeah. And I think having that relationship, so like I have a friend um, and, and she's been going through some, sh- through some shit. And so like, I'm like, listen, whenever you need to talk, like, just let me know. And, you know, I've gotten to know her to the point where I'll literally just sit on the phone and I'll just sit there like this and I won't say a word. And so then like, if she's having like, I don't know, whatever, some breakdown or something, I'll literally just go, I, I know her to n- enough. And, and I'm always saying this cause this is what she said she appreciates one time. Cause she got pissed off at one of her friends, but I was like, okay, are you good? Like now, what do you want from me? Do you want to yeah. just vent? Do you want to just vent to me? I won't give you any advice. Do you want to just vent, get it off your chest? Okay. Bye click. Or do you want my advice do you want me to maybe tell you what i think or how to go about something like so then like you said just knowing enough of that and just listening and and it sucks man it's hard to be that person that people vent to because eventually if you just do it too much it gets to be overwhelming it's negative Um, in a way it's so negative no it's absolutely you know that's that was the hardest part about personal training to be 100 percent honest with you um was you have these people and and let's be real. I mean, the vast majority are just going there because it's an escape from their life. You know, it's an right. hour that they can get away and, and it's just you and them and they just dump their shit on you. Right. Some and, accountability, uh, but like you said, it's the improvements are usually minimal on eight out of 10 people, nine yeah. out of 10 people. Yeah. And it's, you know, yeah. yeah. So, you know, eventually you go home and it's just a lot. <laughs> it's just a lot right. of crap but that then, you like, just count all day. You got, and as a coach, you you're paid to be high energy, positive, and like on days you feel like shit, like you can't, you're not allowed to vent because that's, you're ruining their experience. They're paying you a hundred bucks an hour to deal with this shit. And it's like, yeah, I, I can relate when you're doing like eight sessions in a day, nine sessions in a day. And you're just like, dude, I'm fucking drained from just telling people and listening to people and like taking all their shit. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's why I like kind of backed out of it to an extent, you know, in a way. Yeah. Um, Cause it's a lot, man. It's a lot. Yeah. But then, you, you know, like I've had that on the college side too, where I'll like go back in the office and I'll just kind of like, 
And all, all you did face. is like yell and talk and coach, but you didn't like do anything physical really. And you right. just drained. All right. Like I just get done with one and I'm just like, all right, well, that was good. And just kind of, or, or just get ready to go out there, you know, yeah. just kind of sit there and take a big breath and then just go out and then act like everything's cool. And like, you're hyped up like grad school. That was it, man. We were stressing with, you know, classes and, uh, then we would be in the office and we would have staff meetings and then we would have, uh, our thesis to, or our, um, capstone to do. And so you're doing all this stuff on top of coaching three teams and assisting on others. And you're just like, dude, it's just like, God. I wonder why people are on Adderall, <laughs> you know, it's like for real. <laughs> and even, and even then, the issue with Adderall, like sometimes like I got prescribed it and I stopped because I would get anxious. I would get more anxious uh, taking Adderall if I wasn't doing work. Like you need so, to be on the move. Not even on the move. Like let's say I'm outside. Like I got it prescribed last year before I went down to, or maybe a year or two ago. I can't remember, but either way, like, I would be reading and working on a project or something. But then like, if I went outside to like walk my dog, I would be anxious to get back to work and sit down and you finish whatever I did. I had to be productive. It drove me batshit. Yeah. Um, so and now it just made that, me stop. It's crazy that as like a school system too, and all, you know, you, and especially I'm sure you look at like Brown and Harvard and Yale and all these big schools you see kids just running on it because it's like the expectations are so high right. and the workload so much um, to be like something. It's crazy. Um, yeah. But I want to transition to the last question. Yes, and um, so like the big thing we talk about, chase discomfort, just pushing yourself to be better. And, you know, a lot of what we talked about has to do with that, but each person kind of has their own view on it. So for you, like what does chase discomfort mean to you and kind of, you know, in general, like how does that, you know, work for you? Uh, so basically for me, it's just do doing things that you're not good at and that doing things that you don't like. Um, I guess if you talk to a therapist, I would maybe assume it's like when people are afraid of heights, well, you slowly introduce them to heights and, uh, you know, because you can only get better by doing things that, that you don't like. Um, it's hard though. You know, it's hard to go out there and look like an idiot, you know, doing things and kind of uh, exposing yourself to the fact that you suck at whatever it is, but only by doing that, are you going to get better? I love it, man. And I just thought of this actually, and I can play right off that. Is there a time in your life you felt like you had to chase discomfort or push yourself very, out of, very much out of your comfort zone? And is, is there one spot that like pops in your head where it was just like, holy crap, this is uncomfortable. I don't know if I'm able to pull this off. Uh, I would say, uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't chase it. It was forced upon me. Uh, but so going back to my times at Siena, so I showed up to volunteer and I actually, if I, I first showed up to Siena just to observe, then we had a little conversation and then he asked me if I'd be interested in interning and helping out as much as I was willing to help out. So I was there every morning from six to three. Uh, and then I would work another job. Um, come to find out that he was at the time working on his master's at a school called uh, Edith Cowan University out of Australia. Part of that curriculum is you have to spend two weeks in Australia doing a practical. So about three days before he's supposed to leave, we sit down and he's like, Hey, how are you, uh, how are you feeling about everything? I was like, it's good. And he was like, feeling pretty comfortable here. You think, you know, people I was like, yeah. And, um, and he was like, all right, well, uh, just to let you know, I'm leaving for two weeks and you're basically going to run the show. Like I talked to everybody, they're cool with it. And he's like, you're either going to suck or it's going to go well. And I was like, uh, okay. And so basically I, just ran the show for two weeks after having no strength and conditioning experience, only being there for a couple of weeks, maybe a month. Um, so that was one big one. Yeah. And uh, I think the other one too, man, is having uncomfortable conversations. You know, I think that's the, the biggest way that 
I've had it because going back to Jocko uh, or whatever it is, you know, you have to own the shit that you've done. And sometimes admitting that and telling people that is kind of the hardest thing that you can do. But it by is having so hard to be real with yourself. Yeah. But by having those uncomfortable conversations with your friends or whoever it is, I think, and this is just an assumption, but I, I assume um, and think it makes you come off looking like a better person than if you just try to shy away from it and avoid it. Cause if you avoid it, you look like you're hiding on it and you're not accepting the fact that you fucked up or whatever the situation was. Um, you know, when you had a, I've had a team one time that, that I put a workout in and it sucked. It just did not flow well. It was a shit show. And so I basically blew the whistle, pulled together and I said, yo, that's on me. Like that sucked. And that was my fault. Like, yeah. We'll be better than that. Awesome. man. So, cool. I love hopefully it. that answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's perfect. I think it's a great way to end it. I think it's great advice. And I think if people can, you know, take that accountability, be true to themselves, and be honest with themselves, and like honestly, not bullshit themselves. Like, I suck at this. I'm not good at this. And try to not say things to impress other people and just be true. Like, these are my faults. This is what it is. I think we'd be better off because all of us are fronting in right. some type of way so but yeah man i appreciate you coming on and telling your story dude like i said yeah. I, I learned a lot about you and i think it's very impactful to a lot of people that are pursuing you know anything in the strength conditioning field a goal a side thing your, your biking whatever it may be i think they can take a lot of value from it yeah man no i appreciate you having me this is uh this is a lot of fun it's been great catching up with you too man it's been too long yeah absolutely man so all right so, so next time everybody i'll see you guys soon chase discomfort be kind i'll see you guys later